Good morning and welcome to Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Today we're thinking about joy. And I remember I was thinking about joy while I was talking about thinking about joy. And uh, I thought back to uh, youth, my youth in, in church and in youth group and the songs we used to sing. One of them being, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. How many sang that? Yes, of course. And so you've got the joy, you've got the peace, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack. (laughs) So we had lots of fun singing that, and uh, we were a vindictive bunch. You know, we didn't have a lot of patience for Satan, and and it was a very, you know, comforting image to see him sitting on a tack. Uh, Also, uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Anyone remember that one? Okay. And uh, if you want joy, you, should, you can sing for it. If you want joy, you can shout for it. If you want joy, you can jump for it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The other one was joy is like the rain, but I never got that simile. It just, that, I, I could never understand how joy could be like the rain. Uh, so if you want to experience joy, joy is an active noun. If you want to experience, you gotta sing, you gotta shout, you gotta jump. It's a very active noun. Uh, so if you really want to sing and shout and, and jump and feel really good and feel joyous, just think about the devil sitting on a tack. <laughs> and that will really help you out. At least it'll make you smile. So this morning, uh, visitors, if you're a first time visitor, Find one of these on the back wall there, and, or the side wall, and it will have some information, and it will have a nice pretty cookie in it for you, and you can enjoy that, and hopefully smile when you think of us, and come back again. Mark your calendar for game day, March 28th. Don't ask me about it. I don't know about it yet. We'll all have to wait for details that are coming later. Uh, And there's going to be a memorial event for uh, Dr. Bob Plinke on uh, March 17th at 5 p.m. entitled Evening with Bob's Stories. So if you knew this this gentleman, I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful time just uh, remembering him and getting together and fellowshipping, remembering his stories. That'll be at the Pravida Libertad number 26 in Ahihik. Uh, that is uh, on the site of the new Laola Children's Home property. Turn on the road towards uh, Chapala, across from Perico Hotel sign on the Libramento. That's the next day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sue. On the, uh, the 18th. Um, so the 17th is the memorial on Pravida Libertad number 26, and the 18th, 3 p.m., is the memorial service. Uh, If you have a prayer request, there are forms you can reach in front of you, in the seat in front of you on the little clipboard, or you can reach under your own seat. And uh, Phil went out, put it in the offering basket, and, uh, and you will be prayed for. Flowers from Pastor Guillermo in honor of the... 12th anniversary of the Spanish church. Absolutely. There are more things on here on the back of your bulletin. Uh, Wednesday praise and worship team rehearsal at 9, Bible study in the library at 10. And uh, yes, that's all I have here. Anyone going north? If you're going north, ah, back here. If you have... uh, 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 we like to we like to burden you with the task of mailing uh, any letters that are going north, if that's possible. So, uh, the uh, I'm sorry. What's your name? Michael. Michael. See Michael about that. Uh, don't forget to stick around afterwards for coffee and fellowship and some of Phyllis's amazing treats out there. Uh, and um, there is a new members class on April 8th. If you want to become a member of this church, talk to Carolyn for details. It's going to be on April 8th. Uh, Let's pray and start, start the service. 
Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for all of the marvelous gifts you give to us each and every day. And today, Father, we especially thank you and praise you for the gift of worship and the community in this church. Uh, so often we take for granted this building and the people who work so hard to enable an opportunity to come to you and allow us to worship together in song and spirit. Bring us closer to you now as we turn our hearts and our minds towards you in a moment of silence. Lord, keep us ever mindful of your presence as we continue to worship you and to hear your voice through our praise and your scriptures. Amen. Our scripture call to worship today is from Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord, according to the state given to Israel. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say peace be within you. Please stand and sing our first song of worship and praise and remain standing for responsive reading. With that rousing start, I, I think it's inspired me to read this a little differently than I might have. That's wonderful. So um, please join me in the responsive reading and you'll join in the bold face type. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain trees belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. As you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Redidium, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? 
Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribeth because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Be you may remain seated for the next song. Our second reading is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of a son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the things that I really like about this church is that we are a people of the book. And every Sunday we read several scriptures together. Would you stand for the reading of the gospel? This comes from John chapter 4. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How do you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may sit down as we have our pastoral prayer. Our Father, you are creator God, you are the one that sustains us every day, and you gave your son Jesus as the Savior for our lives. We count it a privilege today to be able to come into your presence to worship you, for we know that you are a God that is worthy of worship and praise. You are the one that made and sustains the entire universe. God, thank you for looking down upon us and loving us, even though we are very small in your eyes. God, we pray that we today might commit our lives anew to you. And as we come every Sunday, that is our prayer. For we want to follow as closely in the steps of Christ as we possibly can. Father, today we pray for this church. We ask that you might do your will through us. We ask that we might worship you every day in spirit and in truth. God, we pray that you'll take care of all of the needs that we have, and we pray that you'll be with our sister churches that are meeting today in various churches in the area. We pray for those churches that call upon your name throughout Mexico 
and indeed throughout the entire world. We pray for your presence among each one of us. Give us an awakening. And God, we pray that as we worship today, you might find all this to be a sweet smell. Father, we pray today for the special needs that our congregation has. There are those that are sick. And Lord, we pray that you might lift them up and heal them and sustain them. Today, we pray for Catherine once more. God, be with her and with her family. And we know that you have promised to walk with them even through a difficult journey. Father, we pray also for Gary, that you might continue to help him to strengthen and relieve him of the pain that he might be experiencing. We do thank you for the safe surgery that he had, and we pray that everything is successful. God, we also pray for others in our congregation. We pray for Marvin. Be with him in the nursing home and sustain him each day. We pray that he might have some improvement and that his condition may be better. Be with Barbara as well. Just stand beside her and guide her today. Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. You are indeed our God. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. Please stand and sing our next song. standing and let us join together in declaring what we believe by reciting together the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, we're talking about joy this morning. We're talking about complete joy. And one of the things that I think has stolen our joy in recent years, in the past decade probably, is social media. <laughs> and just all those 
opinions and attitudes that tear us apart, really. We learn that someone we care about has voted the wrong way or, I don't know, whatever, has strange opinions that we don't understand. We can't even be, tolerate being in the same room with them. And it's not just political views. Many of us, myself included, have developed a short fuse about almost anything that anyone else does. I don't know who it was that said it, maybe Dorothy Parker, hell is other people. Well, <laughs> I, was, I was also gonna say, we all want the manager to know just how disappointed we are. Anyway, good news, I have the cure for this horrible problem. And uh, I'll, we, don't, we can get rid of our deep disappointment in other people and their bad habit of getting in our way. Rather, the Apostle Paul has the cure, not me, and we're going to talk about joy today and how to get it and how to keep it, and that's the title of my new self-help book that will be on sale in the narthex after the service. <laughs> the Apostle Paul wrote letters to a lot of different churches during his ministry, and he had a favorite. The church at Philippi held his heart. His letter to the Philippians is all about deep love. It's one of the happiest books of the Bible, and the one we're digging into this morning. Paul wrote this letter from prison. Hmm, let that be the first hint you get that keeping joy in your life may not look exactly the way you expect. So here's the backstory. The church at Philippi was the first European church. Up until then, Paul had been working in Asia, modern day Turkey. And when Paul arrived there, there weren't enough Jews in Philippi to even have a synagogue. Faithful Jews would meet near a river on the Sabbath when they didn't have a synagogue to go to because the Jewish ritual of, uh, would include purifying your hands. So in a city without a synagogue, if you were looking for where the Jews were, you would go on the Sabbath to the river. And that's where Paul met his first convert to Christianity in Philippi, her name was Lydia. She was a businesswoman, originally from Asia Minor. Another convert was the man who held Paul and his partner Silas in jail. Yeah, that's right, in trouble again, <laughs> that Paul. He, uh, he was in jail for healing a demon-possessed woman. And there you have it. There's another hint that joy isn't all about getting everything you want. I'm guessing that the healed woman may have been his second convert in the area. But we know for certain that Paul's jailer did become a Christian that first night that Paul and Silas were in jail. And his whole household, the jailer's whole household, joined the new Philippian church. And I kind of wonder if any of the other prisoners there also believed. So the little church gathered each week at Lydia's house, and that's the background for our book of Philippians. The key word that we're obviously talking about is joy. And the key verse is Philippians 2.2, 2, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So if we're talking about how do we make our joy complete, what is the answer to that question? And I'm not going to build up to it. I'm just going to give you the answer. I won't make you guess. Do you want to guess? No, I'm kidding. The answer is unity. Paul says unity is how, as Christians, we can grow spiritually as individuals and as a church. And that's what brings complete joy. Paul tells us how this works beginning in Philippians 2. He says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So Paul starts by saying, as Christian believers, we are all united in Christ. We have his love. We have the Holy Spirit, right? All of us. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, we already do have those things, these important things in common with each other. 
we share in all those benefits, and the benefits look pretty joyful to me. Encouragement and comfort, sharing, tenderness, compassion. God has provided all of these things, and we do have them. And let's soak in that for a minute. The word that Paul keeps repeating here is if, 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 but that doesn't mean maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's better understood as the word since or because, because you have encouragement from being united with Christ, because you are comforted by his love, because you share within the spirit, because you have tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. So we enjoy God's encouragement, comfort, fellowship, tenderness, and compassion, not just through the Holy Spirit, not just through the Holy Spirit, but through each other, because we are all in Christ. In Christ, there exists encouragement. So picture Jesus coming alongside of you to help you, to give you advice and counsel. And then picture one of your fellow church members doing that. After all, we are all of us part of the body of Christ. So if we're in Christ, we can do that for each other. There's comfort from his love. Imagine receiving a hug from your heavenly father or from one of us. There's fellowship in the spirit. You and your Christian brothers and sisters share his gifts and his ministry, and we work together side by side in partnership and in cooperation. There's affection and tenderness. I hope you feel my affection for you. There's sympathy and compassion. And best of all, it's all worked out here among our brothers and sisters. Now, now that we've basked in this wonderful picture of our life in Christ, there's one more thing Paul says will make it all complete. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. The same, being one, all of that says to me, unity. Unity is essential for the progress of the gospel and for the growth of the church. In churches, we often separate ourselves, we segregate ourselves into communities, sometimes called denominations, where we generally agree about biblical principles, about the theology, moral, spiritual, and even cultural issues. And when we disagree, people pick up and leave. Even in a small area like Lakeside, there are plenty of churches to choose from, or are no church at all. And that's disunity. I don't believe this is ideal, there is and there should be diversity in the communion of the saints. And part of why we're here on earth is to become more kingdom-minded, more unified. When we avoid each other, we don't learn to love. When we quit going to church without working out our disagreements, we aren't becoming more Christ-like. Paul gives us further instruction in how, how to gain unity. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Humility is what leads to unity, which is what leads to joy. So what is humility? Coincidentally, I've been reading a book called Humble by a PhD, an expert named Daryl Von Tongeren, and he says that humility, first of all, is knowing ourselves, having an accurate view of ourselves, including our strengths and our weaknesses. Humble people know what they're good at, as well as what areas could benefit from improvement. Most people believe that humble people shouldn't even think about, much less speak about, their strengths. But that's, not, that's really not the case. Humble people accept the reality of who they are both the flattering and the unflattering. Paul completely agrees with this and says so in Romans. Romans 12, 3 says, For the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. That is, in reality, who are you? In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So the first part of humility is knowing ourselves, and the second part is checking our ego, or being a little unselfish here. We all tend toward selfishness. It's natural for us to accept the praise and pass the blame. But humility turns this on its head. 
a humble person can share the praise and the glory with others, acknowledging that many people have helped lead to whatever success that they are being praised for. They're also willing to accept blame or criticism when it's appropriate to do so. Being humble involves owning the decisions we've made that have turned out to be mistakes. Resisting the desire to sh shirk responsibility, to make excuses, and admitting when we're at fault. Here's what Paul says about that to the Philippians later on. He says, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So apparently these two women, Yodia and Syntyche, had something of a blow up, and neither one was able to back down. Paul didn't solve the issue by declaring one of them right and one of them wrong. Rather, he wanted them to come to agreement. He wanted them to realize that they needed to be of the same mind in the Lord. Those are the words that he used in our key verse, be like-minded. It's not easy to back down once you've, been declared, uh, once you've already declared, I'm right and you're wrong. It's easier and much more pleasant, actually, to dig in our heels and re rehearse in our heads, at least, all the reasons why people should be agreeing with us. But it's essential both to our own spiritual growth and the growth of the kingdom of God to check our egos and see where the other person might have a point. And what will bring us together on any issue, even if it means losing. Even if it seems like a huge issue, like who you voted for. Let's check our ego. And then the third part is of humility means going beyond ourselves. Being oriented toward other people. Humble people think about others and take their needs into consideration rather than focus, focusing solely on ourselves. If we're humble, we can empathize with others and consider their needs. And this is specifically what Paul has said in our verse uh, previously in 2.4. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And I think we've seen this acted out in our church. When someone shares a need on our WhatsApp group, usually multiple people will jump in to help. And I love that. Sometimes that gift is easy to make. Sometimes it's just saying, I will pray for you. But sometimes it's truly sacrificial. I have seen someone step up to pay for another person's surgery even when they didn't actually know that person. They just knew that she was a sister in Christ. So, how do these three pieces of humility, or as I like to think of them, the three slices of humble pie, come together? Well, let's look at our key verse again. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. It all comes together in unity. When Paul says we need to be like-minded, does he mean that we all have to think and act alike? Well, we're certainly expected to agree on the important things, like the great fundamentals of the Christian faith. And that's part of why we recite creeds regularly, as we did today, the Apostles' Creed. And by the way, if you disagree with any part of the creed that we read, that's a significant thing, and I encourage you to talk to Wayne or talk to me about it. But apart from the creeds, we all will have differences of opinion. Uniformity and unity are not the same thing. Although we might not agree on minor matters, we can still be humble and submerge our own opinions when we have to, where no real biblical principle is involved for the good of others. This is what I believe Paul is saying here. To be like-minded means having the mind of Christ to try to see things as he would see them and to respond in the way that he would respond. To have the same love means to show the same love to others that the Lord has shown to us, a love that didn't count the cost all the way up until death. A way to demonstrate that we're of one spirit 
would be to work together in harmony toward a common goal. To be of one mind means to show Christ's mind as directing our work together. And can I give an, an example of how that's worked in our church very recently? Last week, on Saturday, we held our bazaar and raised a significant amount of money for our feeding programs, but that, to me, wasn't the happiest outcome. I was congratulating Rosanna, who led this project on its success, and here is what she texted me. She said, I think that this experience is so powerful for the Mexican team to realize that God has given us many talents so we can use them to generate more resources. This, there's a new project that's emerging from this. I would love to share it with you. And I think this is just brilliant. This is the body of Christ working together, using all of their gifts to make an impact on the world, or at least on Ahihik and Chapala. I literally got chills when I read it. So to be like-minded does not mean marching in lockstep. Instead, we're called to have attitudes like Christ, loving and accepting one another despite our differences. And in fact, I believe God delights in our diversity. He made each one of us unique. If he wanted us all to be the same, he would have made us all the same. But we should all be like-minded in our obedience to Christ and in our care for others. Paul tells us what to do and what not to do. What not to do is do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, pride, the opposite of humility, is competitive in nature, so it promotes conflicts rather than harmony. Pride says, I'm right, you're wrong. You have to do things my way or else. And unfortunately, the or else often means or else I'll walk away. By contrast, humility accepts a place of service with concern for the needs and the interests of others. Love is essential for humility. Not that everyone else is actually superior to you or smarter or more talented, but Christian love sees others as worthy of prefer preferential treatment. As a believer, you're not in competition with others to see who's the godliest. Your purpose is to represent Christ. Represent him to the lost so that they can be saved. I know that it's easy to read a passage like this, but quite another thing to put it into actual practice. To voluntarily be a slave to all, for example, is foreign to us as human beings, and we can't do it in our own strength. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can ever practice it. I have another example, an example who, of someone who does this, and he's not here this morning, but I'm thinking of um, Guillermo, the pastor of our Spanish language church. Normally he's in the back of our service helping out with the sound, helping out with the slides, listening. He's the one that all of us monolingual types in the church turn to to help us, and he will take on any task, and nothing's beneath him. I think he has a servant's heart. But of course, the supreme example of this was Jesus, who humbled himself in obedience to God and suffered death by crucifixion. And he did it while we were sinners, not when we were his brothers and sisters. So the self-centeredness that considers only my rights, my plans, and my interests needs to be replaced by an outlook that includes the interests of our fellow Christians. And when each member of the Christian community exercises this mutual concern, her problems of disunity will quickly disappear. Remember, Jesus served us all by following God's plan on the cross. And he served the Father by making a way for people like us to be reconciled with their creator. Paul says we should live in humility because Christ humbled himself. He valued others above himself, not in the sense of thinking that others were actually of any higher value than he. After all, he was God but by taking the position of a servant for our good. So, if we're going to grow spiritually as individuals and as a church, living in humility is the place to start. If we do, we will grow in unity, and then our joy will be complete. The epistles to the Philippians is full of much more about joy and life and goodness. And Paul invites us to live with a single-minded focus on Jesus. He encourages us to live in unity 
and community with our fellow believers in order to grow in maturity. So let me leave you with one other instruction from him. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. That's Philippians 4.4. 4. I encourage you to go home today and read this brief letter to the Philippians for yourself. You'll find yourself immersed in joy and ready, I hope, to practice the humility that leads to unity, that leads to complete joy. Amen. Thank you, Carolyn. And in preparation for giving our tithes and offerings, we just want to do another little memory of, of uh, the church I grew up in. And round about this time, we'd hear the verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each of you do according as he hath purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. As you give today, please do so with a cheerful and thankful heart. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we consider how fortunate we are to live in this town and worship you in this beautiful building, please accept our gifts to you, given in joy, to use in your service. Amen. We come now to our time of communion when we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we practice open communion. All baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. As we do, we remember what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about partaking in this communion. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who drinks and eats without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So now as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Lord Jesus, we come before you overflowing with your generosity, compassion, and mercy. Yet we have often fallen short in our behavior and our treatment of others. Forgive us now, Lord, as in the silence of our hearts, we confess to you and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, keep us ever mindful of your forgiveness and help us seek your path for our lives. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is the Lord, uh, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. As you have come to him in humility, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Peace to you, along with the assurance of Jesus Christ. 
and eternal life. Amen. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows one at a time, starting at the back, to come forward down the center aisle. Once you've received the elements, go back down the side aisles and return to your seat. If you're unable to come forward, we will bring the elements to you immediately after others have been served. As a sign that we take this commune as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus, please eat the bread when you receive it. As a sign that we also share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back with you to your seat, and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. In the beginning, in the beginning God created us for himself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, God, in his infinite mercy, grace, and love, sent his only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship and adversity, every trial, trouble, and temptation as we face, yet without sin. Finally, he stretched out his arms on the cross in perfect obedience to the will of the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he blessed it, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, we do so in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death until he comes again. May the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal life, the gifts of God for the people of God.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you have fed us with the holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you also that you have assured us of your favor and goodness towards us by making us members of the mystical body of your Son, which is the company of all faithful people, heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. We humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace that we may continue to do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Stand and sing our final hymn. richly blessed us and so we ask oh lord bless us your people and now i say may the lord bless you and keep you may he turn his face to you and be gracious to you may he lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace in jesus name